Each year in our country, more than 400,000 American children are removed from their families because they were being abused or neglected. These children did nothing wrong. If a relative or family friend can't care for them, a social worker tries to find them a loving foster home. Many potential foster parents prefer younger children and say that they are not interested in fostering a teen. But foster teens provide the families who take them in with a unique gift, and they deserve permanent homes. Um, Listen to Gabriella. If you could just describe to me what it is like to be a foster kid. Um, what it's like to be a foster kid is, being a foster kid to me was not having parents, not knowing what it was like to have a stable family um, that knew everything about each other and supported each other and woke up in the morning and ate breakfast together. Um, it's a personal, it's like a really personal feeling, so you're depending on yourself. You only feel what's right inside and outside of your skin, you know, there's like a lack of apathy for a while um, because you're still trying to figure out what you're feeling and you kind of become friends with yourself that kind of loneliness Um, and I didn't understand when I was a kid like I had rituals before going to bed um, just to reconnect with the fact that I had a mom you know although I was living in a different home Um, yeah, they rituals. were skills and rituals to not fall apart. And then later in high school, when I started falling apart, I had to reassess my rituals. <laughs> I thought I really had abandoned. There was a loss of imagination and um, loss of, loss of it was a loss of friendship with myself too. After a while, because I could I could care less about me because the situation was shit, right? So, you know, um, I was diagnosed when I had, had uh, come into foster care with a severe case of sarcasm. And of course, everyone who <coughs> had studied psychology knew that it was a coping mechanism, but I knew it as like a, it was like they were my, my spines, like my, um, like the spines on a porcupine. So it worked and it backfired and it worked and it kept me guarded and it made people laugh because sometimes it was, they were okay with it. And I began to like formulate a better understanding of people by the ones who could take it. And the sarcasm grew from, I don't care, I don't want to hear you tell me anything right now to um, witty, almost sharp wit that some people would get hurt by. And it hasn't ended. <laughs> some people say, you're brutally, brutally honest, I love it. And some people say, you really have to watch what you say to people. You know? But if I put my quills down, then it's kind of more boring. <laughs> I mean, you know, and then sometimes I have to reassess again. There's a lot of counseling I do for myself because I've had so much therapy in my life. Why have you had all this therapy? That's, I guess, lucky, I guess. I don't know. Oh, it's really lucky. A lot of people need someone to talk to. Everyone needs someone to talk to. Even if you have a million people to talk to, you need someone that doesn't know um, your family. That was always helpful. I can count now this... I had 17 years of therapy... Um, And my mom put me into therapy when I was in kindergarten because we always did a check-in at bedtime and she said, all right, so how's your heart? And she'd put her hand on my chest and I'd say all the things that I could think of that had to do with emotion and like the, the, the clutching that you feel in your heart when something's wrong. And I'd tell her and then she'd say, okay, how's your head? And then I'd tell her all like the, you know, about my day and the events of my day and how I felt about it and she loved to check in with me and then I was her alcoholism progressed and I took better understanding of it Um, she asked me one day again uh, how's your how's your heart and I said "Um, 
And then there's just a silence and she said, okay, how's your head? She just thought I wasn't gonna answer her. And I ended up not answering her and she kind of looked at me and said, would you like to tell someone else about this? Would you like to tell someone else about your heart and your head? And I, and I you know, I guess it was kind of like a really young understanding, but I just shook my head, yeah. Because I think at that point, I, I don't trust you. I don't understand this. I don't know what's going on. Of course, it all started out with, uh, you know, coloring books and simple questions. And then it evolved into really deep relationships. Um. Your um, mom then didn't let you go into the system. Because she, she didn't care. knew that she needed help, and she knew that she wasn't being what she wanted to be for me. She knew all of this. She's a brilliant person. Um, and she cared, but she, her own demons wouldn't let her just give me up. That was against everything. I mean, no one wants to give their kids up. So, eventually, I mean, she, you know, I had like a number a number list in my backpack when I was a kid of people to call when she was passed out drunk and I was hungry or you know she was drunk and I was mad mad as hell and throwing fits and just I don't want to be near you I hate you um, and that was all written down in my big long case you know about like I had to read it when I aged out of the system I never knew a ton of things that happened when I was a kid because I had just blocked it out. But she didn't voluntarily give me up. They, I remember the sheriff coming to my house when I was around seven, um, two men in uniform. And I opened the door and my instantly, like my whole system just like, exploded and was like, oh no, this is happening. And my mom was behind me offering them cookies, you know, slurring her speech and it was really like I kicked into flight or fight but it was more like a, I protected her and I said oh no uh, everything's fine she's fine and they kept asking me questions how's everything going did you eat breakfast today and in my mind they believed me um, but the entire time I was saying mom just go away it's fine I'll just talk to them and you know I know that from the outside right now, that is just crazy. Like, how did I ever believe that worked? Because they did go away. It's not like they arrested anyone. Sounds like you missed your childhood. I don't hear any childhood. Um, I was out every day riding my bike, and I had really good uh, neighborhood friends. And there was times when I would ask her to go outside with me and throw the ball back and forth. And she, there was always like, I realized later, well, really not much later, but the more I asked her, the more she'd say, no, I don't want to, I don't feel like doing that. You know, and I, if I begged hard enough, she'd drag herself out there, but it was serious depression keeping her from being motivated and included in her kid's life. She just didn't have like the will. Um, and I feel like if I, could go back in time, there would be something like to do, but I know that's not right. Mm -hmm. I understand exactly. Do you have a tissue? Um, I understand exactly. About well, I mean, she, I had a childhood. I had, I had friends and toys and family that would, you know, give me birthday parties, and um, I didn't have a mom. That was more important to me, to have a mom than to have a childhood, eventually. I could go back and replace a lot of what I had in my great neighborhood with a really great mother, and she still doesn't understand that. She thinks letting me go under foster care and never repairing herself or working on herself was going to be productive for me. Giving me up and not fighting for me, she says, is the best thing she ever did. And it breaks my heart because that's not what anyone wants to hear. Um, 
And sometimes that's exactly what should have happened for a lot of people, even people I know that never went into the system. Their parents should have said, I'm giving you up. But um, <clears throat> not everyone gets that. When you went into the system, was the system good to you or not good to you? What was the experience you had in the system? What was it like? Um, okay, my first foster home was my was my daycare um, and my mom never picked me up one day so that was my emergency placement overnight and I slept in my um, daycare's daycare person's daughter's bed with her three-year-old kid and it was like the weirdest experience I've ever had you know my mom always made me feel safe and cared about because I was, if I was at home, I'd like I'd be self-sufficient pretty much after a while. But I was never in a stranger's bed. I was never left alone. Um, there was never like strange people around me. I was never abused. I was just neglected, which essentially is a form of abuse. But it was so strange because then it was it became my placement for a year, and it was already like not the best place to be. My foster mom was a recovered alcoholic herself. I shouldn't say recovering, or recovered, she's recovering. Um, but she had a, an 18 year old daughter with a two year old son. So it was really strange. <laughs> and her 18 year old daughter ha would have her boyfriend over and I knew exactly what was going on and I knew this is not right. Even at 10 years old, which is when I went into foster care, this isn't the situation they were, they meant me to be in. I wasn't supposed to be here. Um, but couldn't change it. You couldn't change it. Yeah. I mean, I could have just fought the law, <laughs> but when does that ever happen? Did <sighs> you fight the law? I never did that. Eventually, they started bringing me to catechism, and I was never raised with any form of organized religion. Um, our religion was a philosophy, more or less. My mom culminated the experiences that we had into share care and be honest. Always keep your chin up and don't take shit from nobody. <laughs> Pardon the poor grammar, but that's how you have to say it. And Did you practice those things? Yeah, and I still do as much as I can. Can let I take a break? At, let me look at my thoughts for a second. Is it possible to take a break? Excuse me? Is it possible to take a break? A break? Yeah. Do you need a break? Yeah. Um, do you <laughs> perceive yourself as different because of your experiences? You're, as this foster... Oh, experience. yeah. If you could just tell it, me. Made, it made me a pretty weird kid. Like a, like in a really annoying, I need some attention kind of personality when I was a kid and then I was like at the angry F the world ki uh, teenager. And as I grew up, I kind of was like searching for a lot of self healing. So. Um, These foster families that you oh, right. were with, did they help or would life have been equally well, bad without them? So after I told you about my mom's philosophy, um, that was something I used as the argument for my first foster home. I don't believe in, in Catholicism. I don't, you know, I was never raised with it. I shouldn't have to go to catechism and sit in mass. This is crap. And I was 10 and I was pissed and they made me go, which was illegal, you know, and I've been apologized to by the powers that be that that shouldn't have happened. But, um, a year later, I moved across the street to my second foster home because I had made friends with the girl that lived there. We were the same age, and I moved into her room. Um, she had two younger brothers and a mom and a dad, mom and a stepdad. And then I found out they were born again Christian. <laughs> and I was like, wait a second, I just walked away from you know, spiritual hell back into a spiritual hell. 
but they were so much more there was so much more punishment and not following God's rule or God's way that it to me I was thinking well if this is this isn't the way Jesus would do it then you're definitely not going by the way of Jesus either and um, I fought that and I didn't win and how did you not win <laughs> I had to go to um, Bible study and then that one ended as a probably one of my worst foster experiences because even though on the outside it looked like a perfect family and you know the mom and the dad and the kids and the dogs in the nice house in the perfect location um, the mom well the daughter and I bickered a lot a lot a lot you know we were like sisters and we bickered about anything um, so one day, I remember we were arguing about, you know, a CD, some terrible music in the doorway, and the mom just couldn't take it anymore and slapped us both in the face. And I, I just, you know, it was like one of those, another body shock moments, like the cops coming to the door. I was like, wait, this is happening? That's never happened to me before in my life. And I did a reassessment of what foster care is, because I was like, wait a second. My last home, I was locked out of the kitchen at seven and I had to go to catechism and now I'm getting hit and I have to go to Bible study. Like where, where is the balance? <laughs> and that happened a couple more times where like I'd be a sarcastic brat and she'd backhand me in the arm. And I was just like, what? Like, I don't understand this. I don't get hit. This isn't, and I knew like instantly this isn't okay. This isn't going to last long, and I'm out of here. Um, and I, the other side of that, I was feeling like horrible pity for the girl that still lived there, because I know she was getting, she had been getting this all her life. Um, she had never maybe been neglected, but to be physically abused like that, just like, like a ultimate domination, um, you could see it reflect in her personality eventually too, but. So you out of there? I was sitting on my mom's lap in '98 at my aunt's at my aunt's <coughs> wedding. So I was sitting on my mom's lap at my aunt's wedding, and it was in my flower girl dress. And sh and she said, "How's your how's your home?" You know, she always asked me in a really shaky way because she was so nervous about it, so guilty but just so worried that I wasn't being treated well. And I told her about being hit and she, like I felt her whole body get hot. She just got furious and she went to my aunt's good friend who works um, down at Emmeline and said, you know, I guess whatever I told her, something along the lines of the foster mom hit her and within 72 hours I was pulled out of the home. So, um, I contacted my social worker and I found another placement and I don't think anyone does that. I don't think, <laughs> excuse me, I don't think anyone leaves a family home to live in a stranger's home. And I think I only did it because I got that pre-interview. It wasn't an emergency placement. It wasn't like a, you're going to go live with these people now. I, ha I had to interview her as an adult. I was 17. Uh, and I remember I walked into the house and it smelled like cookies and there was tea on the table. And I thought it was like, you know, Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> she was this really short, adorable, um, maybe mid 50s lady who had big blue eyes and a smile and red lips. and. Um, I was instantly intrigued, but so nervous. I was like, shaking and sweating, and I had my savior social worker there, so it was a little better. But I am her. My interview questions were simple, you know. You did the interview. Well, yeah. I, essentially, it was like she was interested in a foster kid. She has an, had an empty nest. She didn't want a little kid. She wanted someone self-sufficient, and I think it was for her an experience. Um, 
as I've learned, why not as an experience is one of my philosophies, as long as it's safe and sane. Um, and my questions went, so are you religious? <laughs> and she says, yeah, I'm Jewish, but I don't practice. And I was like, cool, I've never been Jewish. <laughs> That's a new experience. Um, and then she's, and then I asked her, I asked her, so what do you think about cussing? And she said, oh, fuck yeah. And I was like, I'm in. And, I just, and I just like instantly, okay, this is so much better already. I even feel better from, from just being here for the first 10 minutes about the last four years I've lived. You know, it's just like, it was so much more sunshine and lightness and it was a gorgeous house and you know she, she had style and she was there she wasn't like you could tell she wasn't clouded by her own past which you see Nana instantly as just you know almost rotted like a walnut and I always like afterwards I've just wanted to put her in her own compassionate bubble and give her something good she hasn't changed <laughs> and did no, that no. work out, that wonderful it did. opening? Um, I stayed for a year and then I aged out of the system. And aged out? At 18 you age out. Um, some would say they kick you out on the streets, or that's uh, like the, the view of it all, but in Santa Cruz you get a lot of help. It's like the, you know, you would be walking the plank, but they just keep building planks in front of your plank. It's really great. Um, and was the lady said to see you go? Well, I see her all the time. So um, that's kind of part of the greatest experience I got a mom. Yeah. <sighs> it's very hard to um, have an early childhood experience that's a shock like yours and to emotionally get it out of your body. Do you agree with that? It takes years. Well, and even after that, after I realized I had gained a mom, I reassessed again, and I realized I had so many moms that I couldn't deal with them. They kept calling me. Why haven't you called me? Where have you been? How are you doing? Let's get together for dinner. And you know, they were my casa workers and my mentors and my aunt's friends and my foster mom's friends and just like all these people, and they're all, most of them are women, and, excuse me, um, and even though she's not like I don't, you know, I don't connect with her like I do with my mom, because my mom will always be my mom, she's a great person to be around, I gained family in her because she has two um, sons who are pretty much my brothers, they're really great people, and they're fascinating, it's a fascinating family for how crazy they are, I would rather them be crazy, um, you know, because there's music and laughter and dirty jokes and bagels and just like funny movie commentary. <laughs> uh, it was a bright spot and it hasn't dimmed, so that's really nice, you know. I think my foster, ex <coughs> excuse me, <sighs> I think my foster experience would have been shit without the everlasting bright spot at the end. It was the... Uh, it was a light at, at the end of the tunnel, I guess. Have you come to accept a dumb question, but worth asking, who you are? Valuable question. Dumb and valuable. Dumb and very valuable. But I'm curious. Um, I'm genuinely curious. You're only 24. Have you come no, to I'm, accept... No, that's such a lie. I keep saying that. I'll be 24 ne next month. Well, like 24. I'll be, I'm, uh, you know, I'm I'll 20. I'm 71 next month, and I'm still I'm calling myself 71. That's well, good. You, do, do you... Uh, have you come to accept yourself for mm -hmm. the, the rough... Um, My rough edges? The rough edges of the world is the way they'd say it in North Carolina. You've uh -huh. touched the rough edges of the world yeah. in your own emotions. I have, but it's like... A, you have. I kind of rebalanced that thought with the fact that there's been so much rougher. You know, I felt pretty rough, but I've never lost... Uh, immediate family. I've never... No, that's not true. Because I lose them in different ways, but there's not... I feel like it hasn't really, like... I haven't absorbed at all. 
which was nice. That's where the shell comes in. So I can bounce back and be there for other people. <laughs> oh, the shell. Yeah. Good, do well, you have a good shell. Yeah, it's it's permeable, but it's. Um, I try to say that it's a forgiving shell, you know, like I'm sorry I won't let you in right now, but I'll keep you on the outside. I, I mean, you can stay. It's just not going in because I don't really have room right now. <clears throat> I'm standing completely. Yeah. Um, that sounds like sanity. Yeah, no, that's actually the most important thing to me is health and sanity. And if I don't have that, I'm, you know, the rotting walnut. No one wants that. Have you ever seen a rotting walnut? It's no. really terrible. I never have. <sighs> but I have become a person that can um, can be unwavering in acceptance and understanding and see everyone's experience as real for them. You know, you can't say like, oh, you just woke you just woke up one day and said that you had a bad life because your parents got divorced. And that's crap. Like, yeah, that sucked for them. That was a horrible part of their life. And for me, I was like, psh, divorce is nothing. Try no family. I meant to ask you, do you have good days these days? Oh yeah, I have great days. I you know, it's like becoming becoming myself is my favorite thing. <laughs> Totally understand. Completely agree. It's pretty weird this week, though. Uh, I wouldn't say weird. This is not a being at Santa Cruz. I don't. I only want weird. Yeah. Becoming yourself is a spectacular experience for everyone who does it. Well, a lot of times I've reassessed and not been able to see it, and then it'll happen. And I've been reassessing, and I can't see it. <laughs> you know. Uh, in the days when you became yourself, there was nobody else out there who had become themselves. It was a very lonely experience. That was the 1800s. But today, don't you agree? When you be yourself, X percentage of the people around you are also themselves. Do you feel that way? What I'm saying to you is, are you a, do you feel <laughs> in the world being yourself? Or do you feel you have compadres, allies? doesn't matter what age. Oh, there's tons of people. I connect with third graders every day. <laughs> Are you a uh, teacher? No, I'm a behavioral aide, interestingly enough. You um, connect with third graders? Yeah. And Are they being themselves? I work with fifth graders, and I work with fourth graders and kindergartners, and I work with... I work with 40-somethings, and early teenagers and I, I don't know I, uh, my favorite thing is people but I don't get very clingy you know it's not like I need a, I don't I don't seek a million friends I seek experiences as knowing people um, and I, I have a lot of love and compassion and I love to love like who doesn't love to love it's the best feeling ever but um Damage can keep it kind of wrapped up and hard to give all the time. It can also reshape you, like, trauma and damage can reshape the way that you give love in so many ways. And it's so hard sometimes to formulate it right. Like, you just get the formula wrong and it's, it changes and you can't go back. And then you have to apologize to this person. I'm so sorry. I tried. True. Fuck. Do you like yourself? That's a dumb question. <laughs> it's valuable. <laughs> I do like myself, even though I make lots of mistakes. I'm not a big fan of myself right now. You're not a big fan. Hopefully, hearing from Gabriella has you interested in becoming a foster parent of a teenager. To find out more in Santa Cruz County, California, visit www.fostercareforkids.com or call 831-345-2700 or contact your own county's Family and Children's Services Agency. Thank you.